Hi students, um, this week we are discussing despair by reading Soren Kierkegaard's The Sickness Unto Death. So before you start reading Kierkegaard, um, please watch this video from the School of Life. It gives the background of Kierkegaard, describes his life, his philosophy, and how those fit together. So that will help you to understand the reading better. Kierkegaard is Danish. Um, he was born in 1813, and he's considered the first existential thinker, um, if we're looking at sort of the Western European tradition. He wrote a lot on many different topics. Um, he wrote on love, he wrote on irony, he wrote on uh, tragedy and faith and religion and seduction and all sorts of topics. Um, a common theme we see throughout his writing is that he was very critical of modern society and what he called the public. He thought a lot of aspects of modern society were in fact kind of leveling the individual and getting rid of individuality and authenticity. And so a lot of his writing is trying to get us to think differently, to be individuals and to kind of embrace who we are. Um, he loves contradictions. He loves paradoxes. For Kierkegaard, everything is kind of contradictory in life. Um, and a lot of his writings are an interesting combination of both kind of sadness, melancholy, and also irony. He's one of the funniest philosophers ever. Um, he just really has such a sense of humor. In fact, he often writes in kind of a sarcastic way. Um, his dissertation committee almost did not want to allow him to get his degree because his dissertation was so sarcastic and um, full of irony. So he's kind of an interesting figure to read for that reason. Um, and some of the aspects that are coming out in his writing um, have to do with his personal life. He had a lot of sadness and a lot of tragedy in his life. Um, he was one of seven children and he lost five of his siblings and his mother. And so his father thought that God was punishing him and that God would also take away uh, Soren, Soren Kierkegaard at any moment. And so Kierkegaard really lived um, with this fear that his life would be taken away by God and also that God was punishing his family. And so that kind of overshadows a lot of what was happening in his life. Um, an important thing to know about Kierkegaard is that we often aren't reading him writing from his own perspective. He wrote as different characters and he used different pseudonyms to indicate which character's perspective he's writing from. And this allows him to do lots of interesting things as a writer. He can disagree with himself. He can take up contradictory positions that can't be unified. He can kind of explore the full complexity of his mind and his heart um, by taking on all these different characters. So this is a strange um, but very interesting aspect of Kierkegaard. And if you want to learn more about it, there are so many different theories and so many different books about why he chose to write this way and what the different characters are. Um, in your textbook, we are not reading Fear and Trembling, but if you want to know more about how Kierkegaard sees faith, this is a really important um, uh, book that he wrote. And in it, he discusses um, God telling Abraham to murder Isaac. And this is a really important story in um, Judaism, a really important story in Christianity, and a really important story in the Islamic faith as well. So God is testing Abraham's faith by telling him to do something that seems against faith, right? This would be a crime. This would be a terrible thing to kill your own son. And God asks Abraham to do this. And at the last minute, an angel tells him not to do it. And so the way that Kierkegaard is looking at faith is that it's kind of this impossible and irrational thing that God asks of us. It doesn't make sense. We can't kind of rationalize Abraham's action. Um, you know, if we use reason, he just looks like a criminal who's willing to commit murder. And if we try to um, turn him into a tragic hero or something, that doesn't work either. And so he calls Abraham a knight of faith and makes religion kind of this jump, or he calls it a leap. It's a leap into faith. Faith is not something that makes sense 
it requires us to jump into the unknown and to kind of hold together contradictory things such as God is the God of love and God is someone who asked Abraham to kill his own son. So that should give us some concept of how Kierkegaard fits into this discussion of the death of God or our troubled relationship to the divine within existentialism. So before we start talking about his concept of despair, I want you to kind of pause this video and take a pen and paper out and just think about despair. When was the last time you felt despair? What were you despairing over? How did you process it? What did it feel like? So pause this video and spend some time thinking about despair. Okay, so for Kierkegaard, despair is just a part of being human. Humans cannot avoid despair. And that's because we're very, very complicated. And the way he describes the self is he says the self is a relation that relates itself to itself, or is the relations relating itself to itself in the relation? The self is not the relation, but is the relations relating to itself? And I bet when you read that, you thought, what? What is Kierkegaard talking about, right? A relation relating to itself and its relation. So essentially, Kierkegaard is giving us what we call a dialectic concept of the self. You don't have to know what dialectic means, except it emphasizes that there's a dynamic and a process involved. So if you have a non-dialectical concept of something, it means that you can just take a snapshot of something and understand exactly what that thing is. And if you have a dialectical concept of something, it means that whatever that thing is unfolds over time through a series of processes and different dynamic relationships. And so you can't just take one snapshot of it and understand the essence of it. You have to look at it through time and it's going to change a lot, a lot and shift around a lot. And that's essentially what Kierkegaard is saying about the self is that the self is not some sort of static thing. There's no essence to who you are you are something you are constantly becoming and constantly figuring out. And on top of that, you are, most you are most fundamentally the person who's trying to figure out what you're becoming and trying to relate to that process of becoming. And so you're not even just that process of becoming, you're also the process of reflecting on top of that becoming. And so you are nothing but relations and nothing but relating to these different relations that are a part of you. It's a mouthful um, and it's complicated, but if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. So if humans are self-conscious, it means not only that we're aware of the world around us, but we're aware of ourselves. And our self-awareness is a really fundamental part of what it means to be human. So if you think about the moments when you're most self-aware, right, when you are most processing what it means to be a self, it's often moments when you have to explain something you did, right? If someone is like, why did you do that? You're like, oh, well, I was thinking this, and then I did this, and then this happened. And so you're kind of like explaining this process that's unfolding and what you were doing and how you were thinking. And also moments when you have to kind of process how you feel about something, right? Sometimes something will happen in your life and you're like, whoa, that's a thing. We're going through a pandemic and I'm in isolation. What do I feel about this? What do I think about it? Right? And it can be kind of a roller coaster. And it requires you to think about your past and your present and your future and the person you were and the person you're becoming and the person you might be. Right? So all these different self relations come out when you're processing how you feel about something. And then another instance in which we see what self consciousness is and why it's a self-relation and why it has to do with so many different relations to oneself is moments when you're trying to make a big decision that could change your life, right? So when I'm trying to think, do I take this path or this path in life? I have to think about what do I want in life? What do I want my future to look like? Um, who do I want to be? What are the kind of limits of who I am? What is um, what's going to hold me back in certain ways? Um, I have to really think about myself. I have to think about my past and my future again. I have to reflect on different aspects of who I am and try to figure out how it all fits together. 
and how I relate to the world and all these different things, right? So whenever we're working on our self-awareness or doing something that requires self-awareness, it's a very complicated relation in which the self relates to itself and relates to itself in many different ways. So I gave you this clip from True Detective this week um, so that you could um, see a pessimistic account of what the self relating to itself is. This character, uh, Rust, is explaining to his partner why he thinks that humans evolving to have self-consciousness is a mistake in nature. And there's other people who argue this. Why is self-awareness? Why is consciousness um, this sort of human quality where we can despair over our existence um, and we are troubled by things and we're always looking for meaning in life? Why is that something that evolved from life on Earth? It seems a little bit unnecessary. It seems like maybe it adds more problems um, and we could be happier perhaps living a life where we're a little less aware. So self-consciousness means we're in despair. That's what consciousness is for um, Kierkegaard. And he points out the fact that it's really a universal state. We don't have to be aware that we are in despair to be in despair. We just are in despair. Every waking moment of your life, every moment of your existence, you are in despair for Kierkegaard, whether you realize that or not. And so he points out that, you know, sometimes we think despair is this really rare thing, like you're only in despair for a moment when you're weeping into your pillow at night or something like that. And he's like, no, you're always in despair. That's what it means to have a self. <laughs> So he's a very, um, it's a fun idea. <laughs> but the reason he thinks this is he connects despair to kind of having a self-relation that's out of whack. And it's very easy for us to relate to ourselves in ways that are out of whack because we are a contradiction. A human is a synthesis of things that are actually opposites. So a synthesis, right, brings things together and unites them. But he says that we are a synth synthesis of the infinite and the finite, right? The infinite for Kierkegaard, because we have souls and we can relate to God and we're spiritual. The infinite part of us is the spiritual part of us, the part that thinks and creates and imagines and can kind of transcend this sort of earthly world. But we're also finite. We're mortal. We've got fleshy bodies. We have to eat. We have to take care of ourselves. We have to like reproduce some of us at least have to reproduce and do stuff like that like we've got this fleshy material and we, we've got to do stuff with it during our life so we're finite uh, we're mortal our lives come to an end and there's lots of sort of finite demands on us within that time we're temporal um, and eternal and we have freedom and necessity as well right so we are free for Kierkegaard we have free will um, religion is uh, very much based on this idea of free will because you can't have sin and you can't reconcile with God if there's no free will. Um, but yet there's a lot of necessity too, right? There's a lot of things that bind us, uh, like gravity. I can't just decide to fly right now. I'm bound by gravity. Um, I don't get to decide to be born or not. I was just born. Um, that was beyond uh, my freedom. And I didn't get to choose who my parents were, uh, how I was born, the circumstances I came into the world. And so there's lots of things that happen to me in life that I don't get to control, even though I do get to exercise my free will. So the different types of despair, um, he gives us, well, he gives more than just these four, but I only assigned you four types of despair. If you want more despair, you'll have to read further. Um, I didn't want to assign too many pages. Um, but the first type of despair he describes is when we are erring too far on the side of infinity and we forget that we're finite. So he says that infinitude, this aspect of us that is infinite, can despair when it loses sight of the finite. So we have a certain desire to be infinite. Um, this comes from our sort of spiritual side, or if you are thinking less spiritually, it has to do with the sort of higher mental activities that we have, like the ability to create art and poetry and philosophize and think about the meaning of the world and what life is, 
all these things have to do with the infinite aspects of um, what it means to be a self-conscious human being. And he says that either someone plunges into the infinite or they can be carried away by the infinite. And we do this particularly, he says, when we're indulging in fantasy, because the fantastic has to do with our imagination. And our imagination is the part of us that allows this sort of infinite reflection to happen. So poets, right, get lost in language, get lost in words, um, get lost in beauty. And that kind of describes what it's like to be um, either plunging or getting carried away by the infinite. And he says that the problem with it is when the infinite loses sight of what's finite, you know, the fact you're mortal, the fact you're fleshy, you end up in this sort of abstract isolation. You end up losing aspects of yourself, the human part of you, the concrete part of you that needs to eat and sleep. Um, and he says that this ends up being a sort of intoxication, right? So when you're intoxicated, on alcohol, <laughs> you lose yourself, but you can be intoxicated by ideas and imagination and you can lose yourself in imagination. So an example of this would be the movie Black Swan um, by Aronofsky. And Aronofsky, Darren Aronofsky movies are like very much obsessed with people getting lost in the infinite. His first movie, Pi, was about a mathematician who discovers the sort of algorithm, uh, the sort of mathematical language behind existence and loses his mind because he kind of like understands God and all of existence all at once. It's a, it's a really fun black and white movie. It's great for college students taking existentialism classes. So you should watch Pi. But you're probably more familiar with the story of Black Swan where we have this character who is so obsessed with ballet and she's trying to kind of tap into um, this ballet and right it's sort of like getting lost in the creative unconscious right she's getting lost in this fantasy um, about this story within the ballet where there's a white swan and a black swan but they're the same character and so she's unlocking parts of herself she didn't really realize were there um, and she's pushing herself beyond her limits. She's, you know, not eating, she's working too hard, um, but she reaches this sort of perfection of performance. Like she becomes this black swan and um, there's all these plays with different selves and infinite selves within it. It's a really interesting movie, but here we see someone who is losing themselves. They're having, a sort of misguided um, relationship themselves through ballet, through this sort of creative inspiration of ballet. The second type of despair that, start, uh, that Kierkegaard talks about is when we do the opposite. Instead of getting lost in the infinite, we get lost in the finite. And we forget that we have this more infinite aspect to us. We forget that we're creatures of imagination and creativity and spirit. And we think we're just fleshy vehicles that have to feed ourselves and clothe ourselves and put a roof over our head and make money. Um, and he thinks that modern society tends to have this despair a lot because there's a lot of focus on sort of material comfort in fitting in with society. And so he says what this is, is it's a despair of reduction. It reduces us to being something that is less than we are. It creates a very narrow self. And it, expo it ignores the fact that we do have spiritual needs, that we want a connection to something bigger than ourselves. And so what happens is you become kind of just another number. Uh, this is like someone who might be really happy working in a cubicle, like it doesn't bother them. They just want their paycheck. They don't care that they work nine to five and drink bad coffee in the office. They just want to clock in and clock out, make their money, go home, eat their, pre -pro their processed food. They're just very happy with a very standard life. They have no <laughs> desire. They have no needs beyond that very basic way of living. And uh, Kierkegaard says that this is a type of despair that people can often not notice they have or not they might not even notice it in other people because if you live like that, you might be really successful. It can make life cozy and comfortable when you're really happy with the finite and you ignore the need for the infinite. 
Um, and he says that what this does is it kind of mortgages ourselves to the world, right? It's kind of like a way of selling yourself or being connected to just material things um, that doesn't allow you to be anything else, right? So you have this um, mortgaged relationship to the world. So I thought of the bling ring as a good example of this. This is a Sofia Coppola movie. Um, from 2013 and Coppola, Sofia Coppola is obsessed with um, people who are obsessed with celebrity and materialism. She really loves movies about materialism and so her movies kind of have this vacuousness to them. So this movie is actually based on a true story. There were a bunch of teenagers who um, kept robbing Paris Hilton and I think Orlando Bloom and other uh, celebrities, and um, they were essentially, if you watch this movie, the way it's presented is that they just kind of liked the materialism of being a celebrity. They wanted to look the way celebrities look. They wanted to dress the way celebrities dress. They wanted to be seen at the same clubs and have their pictures taken. And so it's like a weird movie to watch because that's literally their motivation in life. There's nothing they want in life besides these material possessions that make them feel like they have some sort of social status and that people want to see them the way, they want to be seen the way celebrities are seen. It's, um, yeah, that's the bling ring. So the third type of despair has to do with um, the possibility and necessity relation, right? So for Kierkegaard, we're infinite and finite, we're possible and necessary. Now, if we think about possibility, that's like your free will, what you have choice, what you choose to become during your life. And that's not infinite, right? You don't have infinite possibilities. You have certain possibilities that are open to you. Other things are kind of necessary. So there's certain limits to your possibility, but people don't always recognize where those limits are, right? So sometimes people are always choosing different options, always trying to find different possibilities, always expanding and changing themselves. And they're not really making themselves limited, right? They're not limiting themselves to particular things. So he says that this is the type of despair when possibility outruns necessity so that the self runs away from itself. So he thinks that in order for the self to become itself, right? You don't, you're not just a self. You have to continually create yourself throughout your life. He thinks you need to have an eye towards some things that are necessary. And if everything is possible, that means all your options are open, keeping your options open all the time, right? Um, and we know that in life, sometimes you choose one option and say no to the other options, right? You foreclose those options and that kind of roots you in your life. So if you're choosing to keep all the options open all the time, right, you're sort of um, not rooting yourself in anything concrete. And he says that this would make you become an abstract possibility. And this means that the abyss, right? This abyss of possibility, all the different infinite choices out there always remain open to you. And so the abyss swallows you up and the individual kind of becomes unreal and you lose any sense of yourself as definite and concrete. Now you might be thinking, okay, what, what does this mean? So I think the perfect example of this type of despair is Rick from Rick and Morty. So in the cartoon series, Rick is a genius, a scientist who discovers how to um, put himself into other um, alternative parallel universes. And so he can jump between different dimensions um, and different versions of himself. So he, this in this um, uh, story, right, there's infinite, dimensions, infinite parallel universes. And so he, like if anything happens in his life, he can just jump to a different reality, right? So if his nephew dies, he can just go steal a nephew from a different reality. Or if he accidentally transforms this reality so that everyone's a giant bug, he just jumps into a different reality. Um, and so there's infinite possibilities, there's infinite versions of himself, there's infinite versions of all the people he loves. And so no one is important, no one is significant to him because 
they're one of infinite possibilities. And so for Rick, he kind of loses what it means to be a concrete human being. And he kind of becomes this sort of manic explorer with no morals <laughs> because of all these infinite possibilities that are open to him. And the show explores that in many different ways and actually talks about the fact that this discovery has put him in great pain. He's someone who suffers a lot from this sort of infinite possibility way of living. And then the other example I can think of is Phil from Groundhog's Day. And he's in an infinite time loop. And so he's living the same day over and over and over again, which means that he's essentially immortal. And every day he wakes up, he can kind of do whatever he wants, regardless, there's no real consequences anymore for him. And he ends up really finding a deep, dark pit of despair in the fact that he really, he, in a way he can do whatever. And so nothing matters anymore. There's nothing that he's rooted to because he can't build anything. Okay. Whew. Ready for the fourth type of despair? All right. So this is the fourth type of despair that Kierkegaard talks about. And the previous despair was when we have such a great sense of possibility that we forget there's things in life that are necessary. We don't ground ourselves in the sort of necessities of life. And the opposite of that is when you focus only on what is necessary and then you lose all lack of um, all track of what is possible and what is open to you. So you kind of lose a sense of your free will with this type of despair. And he says this can go either of two ways. If you have this type of despair where you focus so heavily on necessity, he says that either um, you kind of focus on this sort of determinism, um, which he says is sort of atheistic, even if you believe in God, he thinks determinism turns God into something who's not a person you can pray to, because people have to have possibilities. He says, true God is nothing but the ability to make anything possible. So he thinks that necessity kind of turns God into an object rather than a subject, um, the sort of like a law of nature or some objective property of the universe instead of a subject who we can have a personal relationship with. So that's one aspect is you fall into determinism. Or the second um, option is that you become kind of a Philistine bourgeois person who focuses on what's probable, um, you know, someone who has a sense of like, oh, these are the things that you're supposed to do because that gives you the greatest percent, you know, probability of happiness. Um, someone who thinks there's a sort of set of rules to follow or a table for how to act. And this means that there's no openness to doing things otherwise. There's no imagination. There's no possibility. And he says that this person ends up focusing only on what is trite and obvious. So if we're thinking about determinism as an attitude that shows despair, um, we can think of this sort of clockwork theory of the universe. And um, this phrase can refer to many different ways of looking at the universe, um, many different philosophers out there. Um, but essentially what it's saying is that it's like the clock, the universe is operating according to physical laws that it cannot break. It's like a clock that's been wound up and it moves in one way. And if we knew all the laws of the universe, not just physics, but every law, we would be able to tell exactly what's gonna happen. There's no individual choice. There's no individual free will. If you feel like you're making a choice, it's just because you don't see the mechanisms behind that choice. So if I'm like, oh, do you want Coke or Dr. Pepper? And you're thinking about it and you're like, I want Dr. Pepper. I'd be like, you didn't really make a choice. <laughs> it just seemed like that. You know, because you were raised in Texas and they love Dr. Pepper and um, the, something happened in your brain where the neurons went off in this way. So it wasn't really a choice. So with this idea of determinism, you're ignoring the part of you that's open to possibility, that can create, that can do stuff, that can imagine and make choices, right? So you're really limiting who you are. And for Kierkegaard, that's a type of despair. Um, we see this kind of character in Anton. He's the um, bad guy from No Country for Old Men. And he's really interesting because he kind of 
this movie very much feels like a Greek tragedy where um, Anton is almost like a Greek fury, like a force of revenge out to punish the character, um, the main character. And he flips a coin, he has a little coin toss that helps him decide whether or not he's going to kill his victim. And at one point someone says to him, you're actually making the choice. Like it's not the coin flip that decides, it's not fate that is deciding whether you kill me or not, it's you because ultimately you have to make that choice. And so here we see a character who's kind of like fate and kind of does things that reflect fate, um, but it's because he's ignoring his choice in this matter. And then um, an example of the Philistine bourgeois despair, I think Betty Draper from Mad Men is kind of fascinating as a character. Um, she is living through the 60s and 70s where we see all these women's rights movements that are um, supposed to kind of help women recognize that they have different options in life. And she is someone who is just such a depressed housewife. Like she feels like her mission in life is to be a wife and mother because that's what women are supposed to be. But she's so clearly miserable. Like she is not an affectionate mother. She's ice cold. She feels trapped at her home. Um, there's little moments where we see her doing things that make her happy, but um, they're just like, she ends up mostly smoking a lot and drinking a lot because she's pretty miserable as a housewife, but she really thinks it's necessary for her to be a housewife, that this is her role in life and this is what she's supposed to do. So she ends up becoming really obsessed with things that are trite and things that are very small, like, you know, her daughter's looks or um, looking perfect or having the perfect looking home or following the right rules for when the bosses, um, the husband's boss comes over for, for dinner and she has to make sure that everything is done the correct way because that's the way it has to be done because that's what the expectations are. So she lives a very kind of Philistine bourgeois despair um, because she sees everything as necessary and does not see any possibility for freedom for herself. So I want you to return back to this question, what is despair? What were the types of despair that you were locating? Do they have any of these characteristics that Kierkegaard describes? Have you been lost in the infinite or have you felt like you're stuck in finitude? Have you been, um, you know, full of possibilities so that you lack a sense of where you want to be rooted or where you're sort of bound to the concrete world? Or do you feel maybe too limited, like everything in life seems so necessary and you don't feel like you have any freedom anymore? So um, if you can kind of think about how your sense of despair um, works with Kierkegaard's descriptions of despair, that might help you to digest what he's saying a little bit. And then the last thing I want to give you is the fact that Kierkegaard thinks the only solution to despair is for the self to rest in God. He thinks that since we're a synthesis of infinitude, infinitude, and we're this complex relation that relates itself to itself and is always becoming itself, he thinks that this is really only done through our relationship to God. We only really become who we are when we have full communion with God. And that generally doesn't happen during life. I think this is something you have to actually die and be in heaven um, for Kierkegaard to achieve. Because he says the formula that describes the state of the self when despair is completely rooted out, right? So this self that's in despair during life, he thinks we can overcome that when in relating itself to itself and willing to be itself, the self rests transparently in the power that established it. So when we rest in the power that established us, that means we rest in God. And we, when we rest transparently, I think that means we've really reached this full understanding of who we are. And since in life you're always changing and undergoing new things and always becoming yourself, you can't really rest right? You're always becoming, you're not yet at rest. So I think for Kierkegaard, we're really in despair during life. And it's not until we're dead and we're reunited with God and we can rest in him that all those contradictions, all those relations, all those processes that we experience finally come together. So God is so complex, full of possibility, and it's really in him that all the different aspects of who we are come together finally. Okay, those are a lot of big ideas. 
If you have any questions about anything before you write your discussion board post, please email me. Um, you can also set up a time to talk to me. I'm more than happy to talk Kierkegaard with you, and I hope you really enjoy thinking about him this week. Thank you.